It is so good to be here this evening and appreciate the presence of all. We've got several visitors with us. We're glad that you are here and I want to encourage everybody to think along with me tonight as we talk about becoming better Bible students. In 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for understanding, or, um, and I got, I got a word off there. Go back to that. For, for doctrine, for, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Just kind of, just stop for a moment, think about what that's saying. That the, this is from God. This is that which can make us complete. It's that which will instruct us. It's that which will correct us. That means it's important. And yet, there are people who think the title of my lesson is, is folly. You know, that, that I just can't understand this book. It, it's beyond my power. Some people have reached that conclusion because maybe they jumped into the study and they had no background knowledge, they knew nothing about it, and they just kind of got overwhelmed by what was there. Or maybe they started in the book of Revelation and they were scratching their head before it was over. But there are people who, the Roman Catholic Church, that says, yeah, you ought to read your Bible, but you can't really interpret it. The church has to interpret it for you. And when they say the church, they mean the clergy. And there are groups that might, in a sense, reject that. But in the end, it comes down to they tell you, trust the pastor. Let the pastor lead you and guide you. I want to challenge us all to realize that God has laid on every one of us the responsibility to, as he would say in Ephesians 5, 17, not to be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is passage I often use, Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. To do the will, you've got to know the will. God expects, no, he doesn't say it's always easy, but Ephesians 3, in verse 4, well, let's start at verse 3. Paul says, by revelation he made known to me the mystery of as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. It is my firm contention that with effort, we can become good Bible students. We can understand the will of God. We talked before about the fact that the Bible is inspired. That, that passage from 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, the one I mangled a little earlier, that that passage, when it says it's inspired, that tells us it's all by one author. That if we think, well, this passage doesn't seem to fit with that passage, then we need to keep thinking, we need to keep pulling facts together. When you pull all the facts together, when you bring together all that God has said, it's going to fit together. And as much as we can, let Scripture interpret Scripture. You know, you might ask a dozen people their explanation of a passage of Scripture. And you maybe get a dozen different answers. But when you go to, say, for example, Acts, the second chapter, and Peter says, this is what the prophet Joel was talking about. You can take that to the bank. That's what the prophet Joel was talking about. I know that not every passage has that. But when Scripture does interpret Scripture, let that be the answer. Tonight, as we continue with the, the idea, I want to say to you, I think the most important part of becoming a better Bible student is wanting to become a better Bible student. You know, in 2 Timothy 2.15, the King James says, study to show yourself approved to God. The New King James uses the word 
Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It takes that diligence. The, in 1611, when the King James put the word study, while it wasn't talking about study in the sense we use it, it was talking about effort. And effort, is, it's about a mindset. And I want to encourage us to have the right mindset. In Luke, the eighth chapter, you've got the parable of the sower. And you remember that the seed, he said in verse 11, is the word of God. Well, what's the parable of the sower? Most are familiar with it. The man goes out to sow. And as he's scattering the seed, some of it falls on the hard path. And the birds come along and eat it. Some of it falls on ground where there's rock beneath it. And the roots can't penetrate very deeply. And those plants, they sprout, but they wither. Then some of it falls where there are thorns. And it says the thorns keep it from bearing fruit. And then he says there's some good ground. And it produces. And these represent hearts. There are some hearts that they don't give the word a chance. They won't allow it to penetrate. Others, they take the word in, they may act on it a little, but there is no real deep commitment. It's shallow. Others, and this can be a, this can be a real problem for Christians. As he says in verse 14, the cares, the riches, the pleasures of this life, they choke out the word and it becomes unfruitful. We can just be so busy. It's not that we have a hard heart. It's not that we don't want the word to penetrate. It's just we get too busy with too many other things that we don't give attention to the word of God. What we need, though, is the heart, he says in verse 15, that is noble and good. The King James says, good and honest. Mark 4, verse 20, in that account of the parable of the sower, he said, you hear it and you accept it. We need hearts that are ready. And I don't mean gullible hearts. In Acts, the 17th chapter, you've got the Bereans. And I know everybody's heard this one before. But I want to challenge you again. Look at what is said. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. This is the brethren where? Brethren in Thessalonica. Paul is being forced to leave Thessalonica because of the Jews. The Jews who are unbelieving. Well, he goes to the synagogue of the Jews in Berea. These were more fair-minded. Some say noble. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. If the verse had ended with receive the word with all readiness, you might think the picture of somebody that's really gullible. You know, the kind of people that believe their car warranty is about to expire and they need to call that number, you know? I mean, there are people out there that will fall for things. But he doesn't say they were gullible because he adds they searched the Scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. You know, there are people who they'll believe anything. And then there are people who are fault finders and who are critics. The Bereans, they were neither. They were willing to receive it. They wanted the Word of God, but they didn't want to be fooled. They searched. They examined. They made certain it was so. There's a great heart. Look at 1 Peter, the second chapter as we try to see the kind of attitude we're to have. Verse 1. Now, verse 1 begins with a therefore. 
I always have a hesitancy about using a verse that starts with therefore because it's based on something that's gone before, but I don't always have time to read the entire Bible. The end of chapter 1 talked about the Word of God and how it was by the Word of God that their souls were purified. And he spoke of the Word of God as enduring. You know, the, the glory of man fades away, but God's Word endures. So therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. There are three things here to take note of. You can't be a good Bible student if you're going to hang on to the things of verse 1 the malice and the deceit, the hypocrisy, the evil speaking. You know, I mean, you might gain some good academic knowledge, but you're not going to be the, the student God wants. But the second thing is, you've got to really want it. Babes, they do, they want, when they want to be fed, they want to be fed. And they have it seems like that unquenchable thirst. He's not, I don't believe here in 1 Peter 2, it's the same as in Hebrews 5 where he contrasts the milk of the word and the meat of the word. No, this is to all Christians. He, the, the, the comparison is like a babe. Desire it, want it. Don't, you know, unless a baby's really sick, it never says, I just don't think I'll bother eating today. No, they'll eat at four in the morning. Whether It doesn't matter how sound of sleep you are. They're ready. They're hungry. Hunger for it. Verse 3 is key. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. I, I don't know how many times in trying to hammer home the importance of Bible study, I've read verse 2. Sometimes I'd read verses 1 and 2. I didn't always include verse 3. But I've come to believe it's key. If you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. If you really understand the goodness of God. If you have come to see Jesus as the Savior. If the cross means anything to you. If the love of God has taken hold of you then desire that word. You know, you want to hear from the one who saved you. You want to know what his terms of grace are. And the last attitude that we've got to bring to the study of the word is the determination to be obedient. Look at Ezra, the seventh chapter. Ezra was a scribe. And he comes back to Israel after the captivity to help them. But look at verse 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. He wanted to learn. Then it says, and to do it, and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. I want to focus and to do it. James 1 warns, don't be one of those that just hears the word and doesn't do it. You know, we, people can have a lot of academic knowledge. But academic knowledge is important. I mean, I need to know the facts of the Bible. They're, they're critical. But if all I learn are the facts of the Bible, and I can recite all kinds of things from the Bible, but it's not changing my life, I'm not a good Bible student. I've got to be determined to obey. Now, let's get back to, okay, I want it. I know the Lord is gracious. I want to be a good student. I want to do it. How do I go about that? Well, I have a couple of suggestions tonight that really apply to things other than the Bible, not just Bible study. They're basics of study, but they apply to this. 
The Bible's inspired. But let me ask you, what, in, what did he inspire it in? We talked before. He spoke to, in the New Testament particularly, he spoke to the apostles and prophets in what they called Koine Greek, the everyday language of the people. God, the Almighty, the one who is so much higher than us, he spoke in man's language. And so the first thing I want to offer to you is if you're going to be a good Bible student, you've got to understand the words that are used. In 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, the context, of course, is trying to get the attention away from Paul and Apollos and Cephas and shift it to God. And Paul's talking about how the Holy Spirit has revealed the message. And he says in verse 13, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. The Spirit taught words. When we communicate in person, we use body language to communicate. You know, we can use the inflection of our voices. You know, we, we have facial expressions. You know, there's a, there are a lot of things that go into communication. But what God did is he preserved a book where I can't see expressions. I mean, it makes mention of the fact sometimes that Paul would motion with his hand. But all I have are the words. And I've got to know what those words mean. You know, if I were standing up here tonight and I were speaking to you in Mandarin, I don't think that would help you. You've got to know what the words mean. And I, I've come to Bible classes sometimes and there'd be a key word in the text. And you say, now what does this word mean? And you get a lot of blank looks. If you are studying and you come across a word that you're not sure you know what it means, stop and look it up. Sometimes people say, well, I don't know what the word edification means. Well, stop and find out. What's a steward? What does the word righteousness, sanctification, all these? And that's why I tell people, after you get a good Bible... I used to always say this, second thing you do is get an English dictionary. And, you know, they're expecting, you know, some theological book. No, the first thing you get after you get a Bible is a dictionary. Now today, you, you can find online, you know, you can pull your phone out and you can look up things. Um, I still prefer my hardcover dictionary, but I also realize it's getting older and probably needs to be replaced a little bit, but an English dictionary. The New Testament was written in Greek. A good resource for looking at Greek words, and I happen to have one right here, Vine's Complete Expository Dictionary. This one includes Old and New Testament. Somebody else did the Old Testament. It's not as good as the New Testament part. It's relatively inexpensive, Anybody can read it. It's, it's written for the English reader. Vines is good. It's helpful. You know, you look it up in the English. Then he tells you this is what the Greek word meant. It's a little dated. And you say, how can it become dated? Well, he wrote the Dictionary of New Testament words over 50 years ago. And in that time... They've discovered more and more ancient Greek writings, you know, and they know a little more, so occasionally. But here again, if I were just starting out, my library of books would be a lot smaller, smaller than it is right now because so many resources are available online. A good Bible app can help you to look up words I mean, first of all, you can access a dictionary through your phone. Then you can do these Bible apps that will bring it to you. Those are important. 
But I want to share with you something that I think is often neglected. And I mean, maybe I'm guilty of this sometimes. But when you're trying to understand a word, don't just look it up in the English dictionary. I would say to you, don't just look it up in a New Testament word dictionary. Get a concordance or use your Bible app or an online search and find out where else that word is used. I'm amazed sometimes talking to people about definitions of words. And somebody will say, well, it means this because this is what the dictionary says. That's not really how it's supposed to work. The lexicographers who put together dictionaries, whether they be Bible dictionaries or they be English dictionaries, they don't just sit around and say, what do you think we ought to say the meaning of such and such is? No. They read newspapers. They read magazines. They listen to the news. I mean, they, they work at determining how is this word used in regular conversation. And dictionaries change. Sometimes words drop out. They just, people quit using them. And then new words pop in. I don't think the copy, my Webster, my Merriam-Webster Collegiate Dictionary that I've got, I don't think it has the word internet in there. I don't think it has blog in there. You know, it, it, there, there are a lot of words it doesn't have. Because they've come into the dictionary in recent years. How? No, it wasn't that one day some folks at the dictionary office said, we've got a new word. We're going to come up with this word internet and we're going to tell everybody to start using it. No. One day they said, people are talking about this internet thing. We've got to put it in the dictionary. Well, in the Bible... Words are determined by usage, the meanings of words. If you come across the word baptism and you don't know what it means and you look it up, the dictionary I have on my shelf back there, it, it gives several meanings, but one of them it says, you know, the ritual use of water and it, you know, may say in Christian usage and I've seen the definition that says the ritual application of water, whether by sprinkling, pouring, or immersion. Now pay careful attention here. The dictionary is not wrong in defining that as the English meaning of baptism. That's how the word is used today. It's used to apply to sprinkling a baby. You know, it, it's, it's, it's used in a lot of ways. But what matters to us, or should matter to us, is not how is it always used today, but how is it used in the Bible? And you get your concordance out, and you start researching, and by the way, be prepared for, to spend a little time with this, because there are over a hundred references to baptism in the New Testament, but you'll start running across passages. Yeah, water is used because John baptized in the Jordan. But then you'll come to Romans 8 and you'll read of them, the eunuch saying, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And they'll stop the chariot and they'll both go down into the water. And you go, that doesn't sound like a sprinkling or a pouring. And you just keep reading and you keep looking for the usages and you'll find a Romans 6, 4 and a Colossians 2, 12 that talk about being buried in baptism. I hope you're getting the point that as important as the English dictionary is because that's the language that I think everybody here primarily reads in. You know, it's not, it's going to tell you what words mean today go to the Bible and study how they're used 
how they're used in Scripture. And then one of the most helpful things you can do is to read the Bible in several translations. Now what this used to mean is either spending a lot of money or going to Goodwill, to yard sales and trying to accumulate a lot of translations. Now it just means pull up the Bible app on your phone and select as many translations as you want. You know, if you're using a tablet, you can have I don't know how many open at one time. Uh, but it's so helpful. Particularly, I think you get list. Romans 1, toward the end of the chapter, you've got this list of sins. Romans 6, I mean, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, something similar. Galatians 5, 19 through 24, where you've got the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Well, you need to understand what those words mean. The dictionary will help. But oftentimes, one of the best tools for Bible study on something like that is take a piece of paper and make parallel columns and just write, okay, in my case, it would be the New King James, my primary translation. I write the words and then I'll take the King James and the English Standard, New American Standard, maybe NIV, do several translations, and I'll put these words side by side. And oftentimes it helps me to get a better picture. It's been extremely helpful to me in studying, say, 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, where he's talking about the qualifications of elders and just make parallel columns and you put the translations there. And again, while it used to involve expense, it's really inexpensive today. And then study the context carefully. You know, words, context just means everything. You know, the word cleave, C-L-E-A-V-E, -E. what does that word mean? Well, it depends on how you use it. You know, in Matthew 19, a man is to cleave to his wife. That means to stick close together. If a butcher cleaves meat he separates meat from the bone <laughs> that's a word it's two meanings are the exact opposite of each other depending on context you know to cleave is to separate it's to join together but rarely are we going to confuse the two words because we know the context in which they're spoken look at context with bible words and, you know, you ever notice that sometimes it talks about works and it says, not of works. Then it'll say in James 2, faith without works is dead. Well, why would he say this about works in one passage and, and it seemingly is something different in another? It's the context. Well, now what is context? Context, now I got this out of the dictionary. The parts of a discourse that surround a word or passage and can throw light on its meaning. You know, whatever's around it that helps you understand it. The interrelated conditions in which something exists or occurs. You know, it's the background. Now, how, what's the context in the Bible? I heard somebody years ago say, anytime he's asked, he'd be asked, an old preacher said, somebody would say, what does this verse mean? And they'd read that verse and he'd say, okay, read me the verse before it and then read me the verse after it. Then, he'd, then he would offer an answer. Sometimes that's enough. Sometimes you need the, the whole chapter or the whole book. Sometimes the context of a statement you know, you really need to know the whole scripture. But we often talk about taking out of context. And that means you separate it, you know, isolate it, and it means something very different. A few simple questions, and let me tell you, if this seems like it's technical or complicated, it's not at all. 
And in fact, what you do over time is you do these things without even realizing you're doing them. But it's important when you're looking at the Bible to ask yourself, who said this? You know, I could quote to you Colossians 2 and verse 21. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. You know, and I say, and other you, know, you stay away from everything. Except if I go to the, the context, that's the false teacher talking there. You know, there are statements from the devil recorded in the Bible. You know, you will not surely die. Should I quote that as authoritative? Or recognize who said it? It's really important. I, I think about the book of Job. And you know, from Job 3 on through verse, chapter 37, basically you've got uninspired men trying to grapple with what's going on. And they say some things that are true. And then sometimes it's obvious that, as God said in chapter 38, you know, you darken counsel without wisdom. You know, be careful. Who said it? And the next one is obvious. To whom was it said? Most of you are probably wearing shoes right now. But the Bible says, remove your sandals from your feet. Well, at least God said it one time. But we understand the context in which it was said. You know, we're not building arcs today. God commanded Noah to build an ark. And I think that's important in that there are things said to people who lived under a law that we don't live under. The apostles had a special mission. I shouldn't expect that everything Jesus promised the apostles, he's going to promise me. Because I don't have the same mission they had. You know, I think about 1 Timothy 5, in verse 16. He says, if any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them, and do not let the church be burdened, that it may relieve those who are really widows. He making, he's making a distinction between what the individual had his responsibility toward his widowed mother versus responsibilities the church had toward certain widows. You know, who said it? Is he talking to the church? Is he talking to the individual? That can make a difference. How about circumstances? What do you mean? Well, look at 1 Corinthians 7. Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 says that it's really better not to get married. And in Ephesians 5, he paints the most beautiful picture of the relationship between a husband and wife. And he says it symbolizes Christ in the church. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 13 and verse 4, it says marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. Marriage is honorable. Paul's saying here in 1 Corinthians 7, don't get married if you can. Well, why? Verse 25. Well, verse 26. I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Now, what are the circumstances? <laughs> There was a present distress. Now, if you want to know what the present distress is, I don't know. He didn't record that. The Corinthians he was writing to knew that. And we might find ourselves in some distress in which we would realize, you know, it's better not to marry right now. You know, look at circumstances. What's being said? Things that sometimes related to the miraculous may not apply to us. Does this not seem obvious, the subject under discussion? But look at Luke 21 with me. Let me read a few verses here. Verse 9. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified. 
For these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Verse 25, there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. And you know, It seems that every time there's an earthquake, and you know, earthquakes happen fairly often, but there's a new famine. And some of our brethren that live in Ethiopia and Zimbabwe would tell you uh, famines are not rare things. But when we hear about it, people will start saying, oh, the end is near. The wars, the rumors of wars, as he would say in Matthew 24. Well, look at the subject under discussion. Verse 5. Then as some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and donations, he said, these things which you see, the days will come in which not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. So they asked him saying, teacher, but when will these things be? And what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? Jesus has just said, the temple is going to be destroyed. And they said, well, give us some signs. That's the subject of discussion. Verse 32, assuredly I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all, the, all things take place. Yet we still have famines and earthquakes today. But the famines, the earthquakes, the pestilences, the rumors of wars that he's speaking of in this chapter, those all related to the judgment that was coming on Jerusalem in A.D. 70 that was going to come within that generation. Don't take those things, rip them from their context and say, well, you know, there's talk, you know, China is talking about invading Taiwan. And if China invades Taiwan, you know, we could get involved in that and, and there's the Armageddon. No. no, no, that's not what the subject is. So, how do you learn these things? How do you learn context? Well, you know, one of the things that I find helpful is commentaries, encyclopedias, Bible dictionaries. They can help me to appreciate the setting politically, geographically, you know, historically. Let me know a lot of things that are going on in that. But the most important, the way you understand the context is you just get in the book and maybe you back up a little bit from the verse that's troubling you. And you, you read that surrounding material and you figure out who is talking, to whom they're talking. You understand, are there any special qualifying circumstances? You know, there aren't always. Sometimes there are. You find out what the subject is. And I want to offer some real encouragement to you. The more you study, the more you'll understand context without having to go through all of this. Knowledge begets knowledge. That's what we made mention of a few weeks ago. I don't mean... Quit studying anew. Don't ever become a complacent Bible student. But oftentimes, somebody can ask me about a passage, and now at this point I know, I already know something of the context. I know, you know, you know they ask me a question about, unless it's baptism for the dead in 1 Corinthians 15, and that's a different matter, but, you know, I may have an idea who's talking, what they're talking about. When you first pick up the Bible, if you're new to it, or you first get serious about it, you know, there are a lot of people that have dabbled in Bible reading for years, and one day they want to get serious. 
it can seem like a daunting task. But every little bit you learn enables you to learn more, equips you to do more. And so put the work into it and your years of labor will be rewarded. It's important we do this because Bible study is so important. I know we're busy. We've all got things we need to be doing and we can't devote 24 hours a day to it. We've got to sleep. We've got to eat. We've got to work. We've got family responsibilities. But perhaps we can do better than what we're doing. And we need to make sure that we know this book. But knowing it, knowing it's not the end it's doing it. When you learn what you need to do, do God's will. And this evening, if you're not doing God's will, you know what he says about baptism, but you've not done it. Or maybe you've done that, but there's some area of your life that needs to change. Why don't you change it now? If we can help you, you come as we stand and sing together. Thank you for watching this video. We're glad that you have found our channel. And in fact, while you're here, we would encourage you to subscribe to the Jones Road Church of Christ channel. We have several videos already up. And we believe you'll find these to be true to God's word, helpful to you in your journey toward God. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you.